We are at a major decision point for the climate of our planet. If we keep on doing what we're doing, the Earth will be warmer, weather will be more extreme, the ice will melt and the sea levels will rise. But few are actually looking below the surface of the ocean, and the ocean has a story to tell. It is at the front line of climate change. It's absorbing 90% of the heat from global warming. It's absorbing nearly 30% of the carbon dioxide we're emitting to the atmosphere, and it is absorbing all the water from the melting ice. So it is the unsung hero of climate change, truly. This is what a healthy ocean looks like. This is what a coral reef will look like in the future if we keep on doing what we're doing now, corroded, overgrown with algae and bleached. So this is what makes planet Earth different to every other planet. It's the ocean, 70% of the surface area, 94% of the living space, harboring huge biodiversity. It also gives us an awful lot of other things, food, aquaculture, it feeds people, it moves heat around the planet, it controls gases in the atmosphere like oxygen, and it, there's a lot of industries, pharmaceuticals, mining, tourism. It's hugely important to life on the planet. But there is a silent storm gathering. You can't hear it, you can't see it. And the cause is increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through us burning fossil fuels. Already, just in my lifetime, and I won't tell you quite how long that is, but you can work it out, is it's risen from 310 to 400 parts per million of CO2. That's 29% increase in my lifetime. And when that CO2 is absorbed by the ocean, there's a very simple range of chemical reactions that occur. You add CO2 to water and it forms an acid, carbonic acid. And then that runs through a whole range of other chemical reactions which are also important to the marine organisms. It affects the carbonate cycle in all sorts of different ways. I'm going to pick one. And this is aragonite. It's a calcium carbonate mineral used by uh, organisms like corals to build their shells and other shelled organisms as well use this. And as you see it running through the worst-case scenario, high CO2 scenario, you will see that the Arctic Ocean is already going. It's going corrosive to aragonite. And that's within decades, most of the Arctic is corrosive. That's the red bit. This is closely followed by the Antarctic in the Southern Ocean. Also, the concentration of aragonite in the whole global ocean is decreasing. So even in the tropics, those coral reefs there are going to find it harder and harder to extract that mineral in order to build their reefs. So that's just one example of the speed of change. And I want to really knock this home, as the speed of change is what matters here. If you look back into time, you will see that the pH, the ocean pH, hasn't changed much for millions of years. And then you'll see this nearly vertical line, and that's caused by us. This is the change in ocean pH due to our CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. And it's that speed of change that is really of concern because the oceans will eventually buffer all of this out, but it's going to take tens of thousands of years to do it. So what we're doing now in just a couple of centuries is going to have an impact for a very long time, and I'm not sure we want to go there. So it's not surprising that scientists all around the world have been galvanized when they've really taken on this ocean acidification problem. These are marine chemists out there measuring the parameters that determine ocean acidification. And what they've found is that the top line here is the atmospheric CO2, you'll recognize that, that's increasing year on year on year. And the green line, the line decreasing, is the pH of the ocean decreasing. So there's this direct relationship about the amount of CO2 we put in the atmosphere and the decrease in pH. Here we've got marine scientists and marine biogeochemists, led by Germany in this case, engulfing huge, fast, plastic bags full of water to study the plankton. 
how they will be impacted by ocean acidification in the future. So they are able to control the CO2 in these different very large plastic bags. And what they're finding is even the small, smallest plankton can be impacted by ocean acidification. And if the small, the base of the food web is impacted, you can be sure that the top is impacted too. Here, scientists perched on marginal uh, sea ice, looking at the effects of uh, ocean acidification on, on those communities, and others looking at the effects on other forms of corals, deep sea corals, as numerous as the wonderful warm water corals we have around us. And what they're finding is that um, in, in the Arctic, in the polar waters, tiny little potato chips of the ocean, pteropods, sea butterflies, hugely important food resource for whales, for salmon, for birds, are actually corroding today. Their shells are corroding today. So they're very vulnerable to future ocean acidification. The cold water corals, these enormously important deep ocean habitats, are actually get more fragile as CO2 increases. So again, they're hugely vulnerable. And this is biologists swimming in a sea of bubbling CO2. These are natural vents where the CO2 is coming through the seabed. So this is a fantastic natural laboratory to study what a future ocean may look like. And this is just off Papua New Guinea, and these vents are coming through coral reefs. And you can see a very healthy reef with today's pH, huge biodiversity, lots of wonderful structure creating habitats. And you can see how that degrades as the pH changes, such that there's hardly any structural growth or calcification in the lower pH waters. In the Mediterranean, there's another wonderful vent system. And again, today's pH is wonderfully biodiverse, loads of calcifiers, and then it moves as you get closer to those vents and pH falls to where there's hardly any calcifiers. It goes through a regime shift in reduced biodiversity with some organisms actually really enjoying it. Seagrasses love CO2, so they do very well, but things like introduced species of algae do very well, and that's less helpful. Now, I'm the bearer of bad news because there are other issues happening at the same time as ocean acidification. Oceans are warming and sea level is rising as well. And this means that seawater will warm by over two degrees C on average. pH will fall by 0.4 units. That doesn't sound much, but that's over 100 percent change. And sea level will rise by nearly a meter, 0.8 plus. But if we control our emissions urgently, and reduce them considerably, we can reduce the amount of warming, the amount of acidification, and the amount of sea level rise. And this is a study we did looking at key aspects of marine ecosystems of these multiple stresses, because they stack together, they have a greater impact than one on their own. And you will see that uh, a lot of key ecosystems like seagrasses, coral reefs, pteropods, bivalves, Um, and various fish are at very high risk or high risk at the high CO2 scenario. On the other hand, you reduce that risk considerably if we go to the low emissions scenario for CO2. But there's still a risk to things like corals and bivalves. Now, we all depend on a lot of the services and goods that the ocean provides us, so when we convert those into risks as well, you can see the high CO2 scenario actually means that there a lot of those goods and services, the risk is very high and high. On the other hand, if we reduce our emissions, we reduce that risk considerably. So I'm one of the scientists, growing number of scientists, are actually taking these messages to policy makers, where the decisions, the knowledge is required for decisions to be made for the future. And they ask me, well, what can we do about it, Carol? You know, can we manage our way out of it? Can we adapt? What can we do? And I think there's four things that need to be done. Firstly, we need to reduce local stresses to create that, uh, a healthy system so that they can cope with some change. So we need to reduce the pollutants, we need to reduce uh, things like uh, fishing and, and destructive fishing practice. We need to create MPAs to protect that area, to give it a chance, of, uh, a starting chance. 
The second thing I think we need to do is create a global ocean acidification observing network. And this is based on the concept that、um, how can you manage something that you're not measuring? And at the moment, there are very few countries measuring ocean acidification, and it should be global. And if you look at that map there, you will see there are enormous gaps, mostly in the southern hemisphere and certainly around people most vulnerable and waters most vulnerable to ocean acidification. So I think we need to transfer technology, build capacity, and get more countries measuring ocean acidification so that they can be forewarned and forearmed. Uh, in order to to help manage and adapt to a changing ocean, this brings me to adaptation. Whatever happens, the oceans will change. So we need to think of how people can adapt to a changing ocean, as especially the most vulnerable that depend on food,、uh, fish for food, and and ecosystems for for protection of their land or income from tourism. And it's very interesting that. Very little research has gone into adaptation. We've been mainly focused on impact, you know, what's happening to marine systems. But we actually have to think about how adaptation occurs as well. And this is the Taylor oyster shellfish hatchery on the west coast of North America. And they had massive death of their larval oysters. They eventually tracked it down to ocean acidification events that were happening on, along the west coast, upwelling of high CO2, low pH water, and so now they have invested about half a million dollars into monitoring the water, the intake water, and then they can actually、uh, they know what to do in terms of of this. So this is a short-term adaptation. That it it'll last for a while, but it's not a long-term adaptation. The other thing they're investing in is a breeding program for the oysters. They're trying to find oysters that are less vulnerable to ocean acidification, and this may be important to do all around the world to really help people adapt to a really changing ocean. And what about people more vulnerable? Is there a possibility that,、uh, say, in Indonesia, the culture of growing algae and, and, and farming algae can be used as a means of extracting carbon from the ocean? And therefore, buffer, reduce ocean acidification, and perhaps buffer the reefs. You know, though, though we've got no idea about any of that. But what we do know is that if we do this, we really have to test any of those strategies that we put in place to make sure that there's no unforeseen consequences. And this means scientists working with local communities across national boundaries to put in adaptation policies. So here we are. We've got two choices: the high CO2, business as usual choice, where the oceans will warm, will acidify, and sea level will rise. And we've got the other choice of really, really stringent CO2 emissions、uh, reductions, where there will be some warming, some increase in acidity, and some sea level rise. And this is what they're calling the two degree C target. Now. This is the very least I think we should shoot for. We should go lower, because we can see what what will still happen. There's still risk to the ocean, but it must be the very minimum consequence. So it's a global issue, and we need global action at the United Nations level. And it's not surprising that they're all meeting at the end of this year in December in Paris at a big. Climate conference, and all our negotiators will be there with our CO2 offers of reduction, and we have to make sure that any agreement takes those impacts of ocean into account and mitigates those. We cannot leave this to a future generation. It's all about energy, and energy is all about <coughs> economics. So they're all connected, and we have to change the way we use and produce energy. The future of our planet is in our hands.、Um, Much of it is ocean, and we really cannot ignore what is happening below the surface. It has a story to tell. We should tell it, and we should listen to the ocean. Thank you.